our series on leadership, I'm going to be talking tonight with Josie Robinson Johnson, a woman who is probably best known for her work in education in Minnesota, but she has done many, many things, uh, has been a wonderful supporter of our community. And I am going to read you just some of the things she has done, which will give you a real feel, I think, for, for Josie Johnson. She got her um, doctorate in education at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Mm -hmm. She um, was for four years during the 90s the Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs at the University of Minnesota. She was earlier a senior fellow at the College of Education at the U. She was a regent, which we know what a hard job that <laughs> is, at the University of Minnesota back in the 70s. Uh, she was also the acting director for the Minneapolis Urban League, um, and that was in the late 60s. She uh, has been a wonderful fundraiser. She was the chair of the development committee for National Public Radio, and you were on the board of directors there, Josie. Yes. Um, she has taught some very, very interesting classes, developed two new courses at the uh, University of Minnesota, one was called Black Families in White America, and the other Black People and the Welfare System. Uh, she has done a lot of uh, research. Um, your, your bio is just fascinating. It goes on and on. Thank you. And you've been on a lot of boards. I'm sure you have a calendar that looks just jam-packed. <laughs> She's on the Board of Trustees for the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. She is on the Board of Trustees for the Minnesota Medical Foundation at the University of Minnesota. We were just talking about some of the yes. things going on there. Right. So I welcome you, Josie. Well, thank, thank you. you I'm happy to be here. Thank you over. very much. With all the leaders I've had on, I have been curious um, to find out a bit about your early life because, you know, as we know, that really shapes us. Where were you born and, and where were you and your family? All right. I think you're right. Um, much of who we are is a collection of where we've been and what we've done. I, uh, I'm fortunate to have had the kind of parents that I had. Mm -hmm. I was born in San Antonio, Texas, and my family moved to Houston, Texas, and so I was raised there. Uh, both my parents uh, were college graduates, and that's kind of unusual for African Americans in Texas and in and the South, in anywhere. That time that period, time in period. Our country, period, exactly. Because my my father graduated in 1926, and my mother in 1929. Mm -hmm. So, um, but. Even though my dad graduated from college, he was not able to do what he wanted to do, and so the job that he could get was as a dining car waiter on the Southern Pacific Railroad. And Daddy did that for many years. What I learned from both of them, and my mother's message to my two brothers and to, to me, was that you didn't allow other people's prejudice to determine your direction, that it was their problem when they behaved in ways that we thought were unfair, not yours, and it had nothing to do with you as the human being and the person. So we felt pretty secure and comfortable as uh, kids growing up yeah. in the area. We also were fortunate because our parents were professionally trained, and they could give us the kind of support that you need to grow up and be healthy. And did they well. expect you and uh, urge you to to think of college? Was that a given in your home? That was a given. Mm -hmm. It's a given in most. The African American experience has always been linked to education, and I'm glad you asked the question because too often people are not aware of that. We as a people have placed enormous hope in education. Our ancestors from slavery studied when they could, even though there were laws that uh, tried to prevent that to the degree of punishing white people who assisted 
our slave ancestors and learn things like cutting off fingers or uh, charging them fines or putting them in jail. There were laws that said you could not teach the slaves to read or to write. But it was a very, it had very high value for my people. So it was normal and natural when you could. My paternal grandfather, my dad's father, went to eighth grade at Houston Tillotson College, which was mm -hmm. Uh, in Austin, Texas. He went as far as he could go. And so education was important. It never occurred to me that I would not go. Not a choice. At least I didn't feel it was. how did you choose Massachusetts, Josie? That's a long ways from home. Well, uh, my undergraduate was at Fisk University oh. in Nashville, Tennessee. And that was a historic black school. Right. My parents went to Purview in Houston, in, right outside of Houston, Texas. But my mother and father assisted us in looking at other institutions. And there were just a few uh, historic black institutions. I graduated in 47 from high school. So the schools that were available to us were principally, unless you went north, they were principally historic black schools. And Fisk was uh, and is one of the leading uh, African-American institutions. Many of the people in my hometown of Houston had gone there and my pa par parents' uh, close family friends. So that's where so I that went. Was a natural for went to Nashville mm -hmm. uh, to uh, go to undergraduate school. When I graduated from there, I got married soon after that. Had planned to go on to uh, school of social work at mm -hmm. uh, Atlanta University. Got married. My husband had a um, fellowship at MIT to study mm -hmm. mathematics, and so we went to Massachusetts. And I worked there at Harvard and MIT. And then we moved to Minnesota because he got a job here with Honeywell. So that's how we got ah, all the way here. I did want to find out Yes. That. And then later on, um, I went to Massachusetts to do my graduate study. I had started here, but then went to Massachusetts. And my um, friend there, invited me to come to Massachusetts and do my advance work. Um, when, you, when you think back on, on um, your education, did, did pieces of it help you in becoming a leader? Or do you think your natural leadership abilities were just that? Were they more natural? Or were there courses or teachers that kind of got under your skin in a way that you thought, I want to, to do leading as part of my work. Well, um, my parents were my teachers as far as community service and being involved in the community. Leader can be misunderstood sometimes. What I think happens is that in a community when you are committed to it and to the work that you're doing and you have a sense of responsibility as most of us have. My parents used to say, but for the sake of God go I. And so you and my dad was a very active person. My dad and I um, went from door to door when I was a teenager to get petitions signed to do away with the poll tax. In Texas, black people had to pay a poll tax, that is a tax to go to the polls to register and to vote, or, or to vote, and um, we wanted to do away with that, so my father and I did. He was a, he was a precinct judge, he was very active in the community, he worked with the YMCA, and he was just busy and active. So it was a model so that we all saw, my brothers and I. A mentor, 
Um, well, and it's something you see. It's you take it for granted. That's mm -hmm. what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. My mother was more of a social worker. Her education, her field was education. So she did things like uh, work in the community. She ran a, a project. She worked with, um, set up a nursery school for children. She mm -hmm. taught white illiterate women to read. So mm -hmm. there was um, an environment that that we um, accepted. Mm -hmm. You didn't think about whether mm -hmm. that was something or you were being mentored. It's the modeling so that really they did. from your home, environment, this natural pattern evolved, didn't Exactly, it? Mm -hmm. yes, and from the people around us, our neighborhood, our community, uh, people were busy and active, and so that was just what you did. What was the, the work, career kind of piece, do you think, Josie, that, that was a big stepping stone for you in terms of becoming a leader, in terms of some of your teaching and some of your work with the Urban League, what, what piece got you into real high leadership here in Minnesota? Well, um, I'm always sensitive about the word leader, but I think I understand the context that you're using it. When we moved to Minnesota in 56, um, we had a daughter, two years old who is now deceased and a daughter um, six weeks old mm -hmm. and then our third daughter was born here and I wanted to know about my new state so as soon as I came and got to know some people I joined the League of Women Voters because I wanted to know about the city and the state governments and how it works and and so I was uh, I had that opportunity also because I had some uh, experience with politics and other things and because my father's example of joining and being active and doing things um, it gave me the opportunity to be involved with the NAACP almost immediately mm -hmm. and with the Urban League and with other kinds of things. I was a lobbyist in the early 60s uh, for fair housing and for equal job opportunity. So and some so of your volunteer work really sort of pushed you forward. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, much of what I did was as a volunteer. I didn't actually work for a salary of any kind until I accepted the position as acting director of the Urban League. Mm -hmm. Which is and in the late 60s. That was in the mm -hmm. late 60s. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, you know, serving as, um, we had a program for mentoring girls in mm -hmm. junior high school. We think we may have had the first uh, program uh, that um, was the Upward Bound. It was the mm. Upward Bound program in the state of Minnesota. Mm. And we had a group of young women to be involved in that. So I think, you know, it's hard to say any, you can't Not, uh, mm. highlight any one. It's sort of a, mm -hmm. uh, an accumulation of things. And your sense of being responsible for your community and doing whatever you can do to do the things that need to be done for African American people and for the community in general. Because there were a lot of things here too when we came. You um, alluded to the fact that we haven't really defined leadership, yeah. the, the two of us. How, how do you define it and what do you think are the qualities that make for a good leader that are important, that are necessary? Well, <clears throat> I think uh, when we talk about leadership and and follow people following you, um, I think of it more in terms of your time and energy to do a task. Mm -hmm. And if you are successful, then there will be some understanding of what you've done and perhaps the invitation to do other things. But it's not because you have anything that's considered in the classical sense 
leadership or someone identifying you and considering you a leader, but it is a person willing to work and to do some of the things that need to be done. So it's, uh, and then having uh, a sense of goal setting, determination, mm -hmm. um, review. I think you really have to analyze what you've done. Mm -hmm. Figure out, you know, did it work or didn't mm -hmm. it? What so do you look need to back do? back after the, well, the analysis or always. after the class or whatever. Absolutely. It's always critical. And do, I you, think. do you ask yourself, what did I do here that I didn't feel good about or that didn't work and how can I change that? Oh yes, I, I think that's a part critically. of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the other is for many of us who find ourselves um, engaged in activities and projects, you don't realize that someone may consider what you're doing as unique or different because it's a part of what you do. It's a way of thinking. It's a process. So I remember um, when I worked with the League of Women Voters and the State Department of Civil Rights on the passage of the Fair Housing, and this was in 62, 1962, uh, when I was asked to develop a manual of how, a how-to, that to me seemed very unusual and difficult. Because Overwhelming, you, I would say. <laughs> well, difficult, because uh -huh. you did what had to be done. You knew how to treat people. You knew when to try and talk to them, when not to, what information to provide them, how to avoid bugging them, <laughs> how to avoid uh, making them angry with you and your efforts. So what you found is that um, there are things you do that you don't realize that uh, someone else may think what you need to do is write it down or just mm -hmm. steps, mm -hmm. step by step. It's, uh, it becomes kind of a natural process. Yeah. What's the, the most difficult challenge that you have had, Josie, when you think of all the different positions you've been in, the different leadership places you've served, um, what's been the issue or the experience that tested you the most? Well, you know, I think um, what has been uh, difficult and, and disappointing has been to realize that we spent a lot of time as a people trying to identify the issues of racism and denial and need for equal opportunity and social justice and human rights. Mm -hmm. And we spent lots of hours talking about these things with many people and trying to pass humane legislation and creating an opportunity for the larger system. It was my belief that the reason we were um, suffering from the issues of racism and discrimination was that people didn't know. If they knew differently, mm -hmm. they would behave differently. So you spent a lot of time in the whole field of, of education and information and trying to communicate the issues with people. And to find out, that was, of course our ancestors started long before that, but the moment of our involvement in the 50s and 60s. And here we are in 2002, and many of these issues are still on the table. Mm -hmm. And they are still as critical as they ever were. And that there are times when I feel that I'm not sure that my children, African American children, will survive this period because there is so much that's going on that's denying them the opportunity to do the things that their spirit wants them to do. How do you, in the most personal sense, deal with this disappointment yeah. so that you don't become 
angry or bitter. Yes. Or maybe you do. But well, actually, it's such a good question because there are, I, I, I know that under normal circumstances, you would. You would be discouraged and depressed and angry. And, mm -hmm. But I think there is a human spirit. There's a quality about um, the things that you do and you you keep on keeping on, to use my father's expression. Mm -hmm. And when I realize that our ancestors um, survived slavery, post-slavery, and the periods that followed that, and still somehow maintain a sense of ethics and responsibility and commitment, I say, there's no reason for me to give up or to be discouraged and depressed. So you just do. You just do. You so know you can talk yourself out of that sense of discouragement that, that comes. Well, you know, I again, that's one of those things. I don't know what the process is. I just mm -hmm. know that... The results, kind of. The, right. Yeah, you, mm -hmm. can't, you can't afford. There's too mm -hmm. much there's too much resting on what you do and how you teach and how you interact to be bitter because I think that most people want to do the right thing. I still believe that. I still believe that there is the desire to do what's right and what's humane and just. It's just that we have a system that has taught us not to treat certain people that way. And it is so deeply etched in the fabric of human beings that they react sometimes out of this instinctive behavior rather than a thoughtful, careful review. What do you think, <clears throat> as someone who has lived this, has studied it, has taught it, what do you think we need to do, Josie, as a country, as a world, to, to move further, to move faster away from racism? What, what is at the <sighs> forefront of your mind in terms of a wish list? Well, I, I, I do believe in dialogue. Now, that may be old-fashioned, but I believe people need to talk more I think they need to be honest. We need to free people from feeling that if they have a question that they don't know the answer uh, about people of color or people who are different, that if they ask the question, they will be classified as racist or uninformed or something. We need to free people of that. So they can ask so any they question can, that's on their mind. They can ask mm -hmm. questions, they can investigate the, the, um, the issues, that we create an environment with very young kids. We have a program right now. I said my, my oldest daughter is, a de is deceased. Right. And we have a program uh, called the Leland Johnson Common Vision. And it's named for Patrice mm -hmm. and for Congressman Mickey Leland. The two of mm -hmm. them were uh, their plane crashed in Ethiopia in uh, 1989. Mickey was, Mickey Leland was from Texas uh, and chair of a subcommittee on hunger. And my daughter Patrice, who was a lawyer, was his chief of staff. Mm -hmm. And they went with a group I to Ethiopia. About the That's crash, correct. So we have a program of young Jewish and black students, high school, working together to learn together and understand each other and to try to model, hopefully, how you can learn about each other's culture, history, and respect differences and become uh, knowledgeable and, and conversant with each other, travel together, we say, travel, get to know each other, and learn together, do projects. So it's that, 
And I hope that this model works because I believe that if this two group of young people, African Americans and Jewish youngsters, can come together and understand each other, raise questions. If we can create a trusting environment so they can ask each other questions without the feeling that they're going to be uh, classified in some negative way, I think we can do it with other groups as well. So but as you say, this is a model. Mm. Tell me again the, the name of the organization. It's called Leland, it's L-E-L-A-N-D, Johnson, mm -hmm. Common Vision Program. And the common vision is coming together to try and have common ground of understanding and developing uh, uh, an appreciation. Learning to talk, learning to think critically, and to uh, figure out with good, careful direction how to problem solve, how to ask questions, how to get at answers, how to test some of the myths that we all have. And we think that the younger group may be able to do it better than the two of us. <laughs> so all important things in making progress and in developing leaders, too. Exactly. That's exactly right. We are out of time, Josie. Oh my. I want to thank you so much well, for joining me and sharing some of your life and some of your vision thank and you. Um, wonderfully thoughtful ideas. So well, I appreciate I enjoyed that. It. Thank you. I've enjoyed it too. Good. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back again next week. Until then, have a good week.